Hey guys, welcome to this summer crop tour, the second part. Uh, I'm Rebecca Zach. I'm the crop production agent here in River Valley. Uh, today we have a, a few guests here. Uh, we have Rodrigo uh, and Jeff Whitworth who are going to talk about uh, fungicides, disease, and some insects. All right. And we also have Scott Dooley here. He's the field manager. He can introduce himself a little. I'm Scott Dooley. Uh, I manage the farm here. Um, I've been in the department for several years and finally transitioned up here. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, we've got a field day coming up this fall, um, August 17th at 6 p.m. at the Scandia headquarters. We'll talk about herbicides, um, a crop rotation study, and a um, rooting system study as well. Um, next up will be Jeff Whitworth, who will talk about some insect issues. Good morning. I'm Jeff Whitworth, Extension Specialist in Entomology uh, for Kansas State University. It's a great morning to be out here in uh, north central Kansas, I guess, at the experiment station, experiment field. Um, as you can see out here, the crops are looking good, really good. Um, so. I think we'll take just a little bit of time to talk about the various crops and the various pests that we've seen up to this point in time uh, throughout the state and what that may pretend for oh, the next month or two months or three months or whatever uh, until harvest at least. Um, first of all, I'd like to, I know we don't have any right now, but there's a lot of alfalfa around and I get a lot of calls and a lot of concern about alfalfa pests and we just, you know, we, we just completed probably the second cutting of alfalfa for the most part around the state and the first cutting a lot of it was donated to the alfalfa weevil because it couldn't get in and get it sprayed in a timely fashion and that's kind of normal but right now what we're seeing in soybeans which you can see behind me and alfalfa are the potato leaf hopper and I get a lot of calls every year about potato leaf hoppers <clears throat> generally you see them first in the soybeans uh, because they're blind green they have a herky-jerky motion and they'll be out on top of the leaves and guys are out looking at their young beans to make sure they get a good stand and they'll often notice these little potato leaf hoppers and in soybeans at least in Kansas they really have not been a problem they're just more of a concern because there's so many of them they migrate in into the state from the southeastern part of the United States uh, every spring out uh, every early summer actually probably between the second and the third cutting of the alfalfa just when the beans are starting to generally uh, germinate and do pretty well that's why we get a lot of calls potato leaf hopper will bother alfalfa it can be a real pest and I think it's underappreciated in alfalfa the uh, potato leaf hopper has two ways of, of feeding and causing damage in alfalfa number one they suck the juice out of the plant there are, they pierce the stem and, and they suck the juice but in so doing they introduce a toxin and that toxin in concert with the juice removal especially in what July August even into September in Kansas can can be pretty stressful to alfalfa can cause some yellowing um, a lot of times I think that's one of the reasons why the potato leaf hopper goes unappreciated in alfalfa is because they're out there and they're causing the toxin. They cause what we term hopper burn where the tips of the leaves will turn yellow and then if the feeding continues it will go on down the leaf on down the stem. It can actually cause the whole soybean plant to wilt. It can really can really cause a problem uh, and a lot of times this time of year hot and dry in Kansas People, the growers know that alfalfa is a cool weather crop, so they just think maybe the hot, dry weather is causing that, and that's probably adding to it. But potato leaf hoppers, and they have a very low treatment threshold. If you have oh, two to three potato leaf hoppers per 10 sweeps of a sweep net, uh, that probably would justify treating your alfalfa, or the better recommendation is if, if you can, just cut it or swath it get it out of the field and that will remove the problem and generally we don't see potato leaf hoppers return to a field once it's swathed if it's timely if it if the swathing or the cutting is in a timely fashion we had some plots right up here right down the road uh, from Belleville several years ago for potato leaf hoppers and they were swarming in there 
and every insecticide that we tested worked really well. So if you do have to do, decide to do an insecticide application for potato leaf hoppers, just know use the, the lowest rate. It does a really good job of cleaning them up. But first recommendation, if possible, if you're within a week or two of swathing when you notice the uh, infestation, just cut it and get them out. They don't feed on uh, the, the hay in the barn. It's just uh, the, the living plant because they have to have the juice from the plant. Now, one caveat to that, if you do swath it, get back out and check it every week or two weeks uh, because those populations, are they're still migrating into the state. Uh, so they can still build up till, you know, till probably mid-October. Uh, I used to say September, but as the uh, weather changes in the fall, they're hanging around longer, and then they all pick, pack up and head south for the winter. So kind of keep your eyes open in your soybeans for potato leaf hoppers where they don't cause a problem, but if you know you see a bunch of them in there, you know you have a bunch of them in your alfalfa if you have alfalfa. So back to, uh, let's talk about corn just a little bit. Uh, right now the corn's looking pretty well. Uh, pretty well watered, pretty green, it's all, everything's doing well. As it starts to tassel, if you have continuous corn and it's not a rootworm resistant corn, i.e. it's not a BT corn uh, that's labeled for corn rootworm resistance, you might want to get out and check it for corn rootworm beetles. The beetles are just now coming out. They're just now starting to feed on the silks. Um, so as, as those silks start to emerge, if you have little adult western corn rootworms for the most part uh, up there feeding, you'll know you have what, you have rootworm larvae feeding on the roots someplace in that field uh, and the adults are coming out. Now Recently, we've had uh, several species of adult grub worms coming out, i.e. the Japanese beetle and the um, green June beetle. Um, so as far as Kansas, they probably go oh, west about as far as 75 Highway in Kansas. So it's not, not, not too much to Belleville, but we have found them in Saline County. Um, so they're kind of easing their way west across the state. From the east, so keep your eyes open for silk feeding. On right now, as your as your silks start to develop, the th if you if you're interested in checking for corn rootworms, you don't want to use a BT hybrid for corn rootworms um, next year, or you don't want to use a planting time treatment, or you don't want to rotate. Rotation still probably is the best choice for corn rootworm uh, mitigation. But if you don't want to do all that, you want to have continuous corn, or you have had continuous corn for three plus years, um, you can still go out and sample. In my opinion, that's the best way to determine whether you're going to have a corn rootworm problem the next year or not. If you have five of your plants infested per 10, or a 50% infestation with adults, uh, that means you're going to have a rootworm problem in that field next year. Because what's happening, the adults are just now coming out, they're mating, they're going to be laying eggs from the rest of this month clear up until, well, until frost. We've actually found them, uh, found adult females full of eggs in October and November, but the majority of the egg laying is going to occur in July and August. So if you get out now until the silks turn brown, um, the easiest way is just to go out and look at the silk, count the uh, number of adults feeding in the silk. Like I said, if you got five uh, plants per 10 infested or a 50% infestation in your field, that means you need to do something next year. Either rotate or use a BT hybrid labeled for corn rootworm. Otherwise, you don't need a BT hybrid labeled for corn rootworm. You don't need to do any uh, any planting time treatments. Remember, a 50% infestation of adults, the bad part about that is you have to be out looking in your cornfield in July and August. Okay, so we we recommend about a weekly um, sampling from till oh, till mid August or till late August. Um, and if you do have a 50% or more infestation, you can spray for the adults. Um, you kill the adults. Um, the adults aren't there to lay eggs, so that's why you don't have a problem the next year. But that kind of more or less fits our IPM model where you don't treat unless you need to. You don't just put a BT uh, hybrid out there just in case. Um, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the hybrids I've looked at that we're using now, 
they're still labeled for European corn borer. I have not seen a European corn borer in Kansas probably for, oh, 15, 16 years. None. Uh, doesn't mean we don't have one here or there, but I'm just saying we don't need to spend the, the money on the technology to prevent against European corn borers when we don't have them. It's the same with corn rootworm. If it's not a third year of continuous corn, you don't need the technology to protect against corn rootworm. So that's kind of where we are with corn now. Um, in this area up here, probably oh, from the northwest quadrant of the state to about Belleville, uh, down to Concordia, sometimes we have western bean cutworm infestations. The, the, they're more severe in Nebraska and Colorado, and they kind of leak east uh, and south. I have seen them in the Scandia area. I've seen them up around Republic, uh, but that's a rare event and the folks in Nebraska are pretty good about letting us know uh, how that infestation goes. I have not heard of any yet this year um, but that's something to keep your eyes on as as the corn starts to silk sometimes we see the western bean cutworms get down this far but as far as corn goes you know 40 years ago corn used to be the problem crop that's where all the pests were um, but since that time they've done a lot of research on corn so they've figured out uh, pretty much how to mitigate a lot of problems in corn. Uh, like I said, we still have spider mites. Uh, spider mites are going to continue to be a problem for a while, uh, but they're a problem in all crops. Alfalfa, corn, sorghum, soybeans, cotton, sunflowers, er, all the crops uh, can be subject to attack by the, the phytophagous mites or the spider mites. So that's kind of it on corn. Um, let's talk a little bit about soybeans. Uh, as you see, the soybeans are looking really good around the state, at least the ones I've looked at um, in the past, you no know, three weeks. Um, we've had adequate moisture, and the guys that don't have, fortunately, a lot of them have uh, irrigation. They're planting a lot of uh, double crop beans right now, and they have, and it's all looking pretty good. Um, now, as far as pests go, soybeans and sorghum are probably the two cr main crops that we worry about as far as pests. Soybeans starting out, bean leaf beetle. That's probably the number one pest we've had uh, throughout the soybean belt in the United States in the last 40 years, or maybe longer than that. Um, but the bean leaf beetle can be a problem. They can be a problem early because they overwinter as adults. And as soon as the alfalfa breaks dormancy, the bean leaf beetle goes to alfalfa if it's not already there overwintering, um, and it'll feed just a little bit on the alfalfa leaves, not enough to hurt it, but as soon as the, as soon as they perceive some soybeans germinating in the area, they can find them. I'm not sure how they do it, but they're great at finding uh, straggly little old soybean plants uh, early on. They'll congregate around those because they much prefer feeding on soybeans. Um, now, early on, while the beans are germinating up to the first, second, third trifoliate, a lot of times guys get pretty concerned because the bean leaf beetle feeds in the leaf and it causes a little oh, round or oblong hole in that leaf. There can be quite a few of them. Think about it. If they're overwintering around, they you got the only early soybean field and they're all flying in there to feed. Uh, that can be concerning. But the adult soybean, uh, the bean leaf beetle, just doesn't feed that much they're more concerned about mating and going off to lay eggs they'll feed a little bit to get a little bit of nourishment but then they'll feed it's just a matter of numbers so early on if you have you know six or eight per row foot and they're feeding uh, like crazy and the weather is not too well and it looks like it's stressed and being maybe it would justify a treatment but for the most part we don't recommend early season bean leaf beetle treatments now uh, that's early season, okay? Those are going to go lay eggs. What a lot of people don't realize, those eggs hatch, those larvae go down, and they feed on the roots of the soybean plant. So if you're looking out in your soybean field and you have a spot out in a soybean field that looks stressed, maybe it's wilting or it's yellow, go out there. Pull up some of those plants and see if there's little white worms hanging on those roots because chances are there are. They, they look a lot like corn rootworm larvae. Um, when you pull them up, they feed on the root hairs, they feed on the roots. It generally won't be over the whole field. It'll just be a spot here, a spot there. But that's kind of what it looks like. Or a lot of times it looks like, 
you know, if you have a low spot in your field and that doesn't germinate as quick as some of the others, uh, sometimes that's kind of what it looks like, okay? But that worries me more than the early season leaf feeding by the bean leaf beetle. And then that those larvae will hatch, those, I mean, those larvae will turn into pupae. The pupae will come out as adults. Then those adults are, that second generation is really more concerning because they will go to those pods and they will feed on the pods, not the beans. Keep this in mind. The adult bean leaf beetle will feed on the pod surrounding the bean. That's important because they will feed there as long as they're green pods. Once all the pods turn yellow or brown, they won't feed on them anymore. But, it, you know, those plants keep putting on new pods. They can keep feeding on the pods, clear up until frost. They overwinter as adults. So they're going to feed out there till they there isn't anything else for them to eat on, okay? The reason that's important is because then we have corn earworms or soybean pod worms or sorghum headworm or cotton bollworm, whatever you want to call it. It's the same insect. Those are going to feed on the bean within the pod. So if you're out sampling your field, checking your field, monitoring your field, whatever you call it, and you got all these pods with one hole, two hole, or three hole, whatever, right where that seed is, that's the corn earworm or the soybean pod worm. It's not the bean leaf beetle, okay? There's a significant difference there because that pod worm's only going to feed for two weeks, it's not going to feed the rest of the year. It's going to feed for two weeks, 10 days, whatever. Then it's going to crawl down into the soil and pupate. Then it's going to be gone, okay? Then it's going to go to sorghum or something else. So if you're out looking in your field and you got a whole bunch of pods with one hole, two hole, right where that seed is, or right where that bean is, especially if it's already kind of turned brown, that means it's too late. Don't spray. The larvae are gone. The damage is done. The larvae are down in the soil feeding. It's going to be probably a week while they're down there feeding. Maybe another week for the moths to come up. They'll mate, fly around, lay eggs. Maybe another week before those eggs hatch and those larvae come out. Those larvae aren't going to feed on old pods or pods that are turning brown. They just like green succulent pods okay so as those moths come out they're going to take off and go look for someplace else to lay eggs and generally speaking that's going to be sorghum okay that's when we get you know what they call ragworms in sorghum and and headworms in sorghum etc it just depends on what stage the sorghum's in but remember the difference between the bean leaf beetle feeding on the pods and grasshoppers and there's some other things can feed on the pods but the bean leaf beetles are the ones that usually are the the density in, is such that it can cause problems, uh, and they can open those pods up so that the diseases get to the beans, or I don't know desiccation, or they fall out. You know, whatever. It's messing with the marketable product, so that's what you got to be careful of, in my opinion, with bean leaf beetles, the second generation, and they're just about ready. Oh, probably another. Now, from what I've seen, probably another two weeks. The larvae are still feeding. They're about done feeding, and then they're going to start coming out. Just about time a lot of the beans start to set pods, that's kind of the way it is. You know, a lot of these insects are uh, well-adjusted to the way our crops uh, develop also. You know, I get I get that question, how come? Well, they've had a lot of time to, to adjust and develop in simultaneously, okay? So that's kind of what you're going to see in the way of soybeans now in the meantime we have dectes stem borers uh, the dectes stem borer that's an adult um, longhorn beetle it's out and about we just started finding them just before fourth of july and that's traditional um, probably the worst field i ever saw uh, that lodged because of dectes stem borers was just south of scandia up here a few years ago uh, we had a little windstorm come through um, up there and I mean, I, the whole field is just looked like a tornado had gone through there. Just it was pretty sick. So um, once you've seen that, and once you've seen corn rootworms cause lodging in corn or hessian fly cause lodging in wheat, it's pretty it's pretty sad. You want to try and mitigate that if at all possible, I think. But the Dectes stem borer right now, they're out and about. Right, well, the last week, and I haven't been out yet this week to look, but last week they were just emerging and they were congregating around the field borders. That's kind of what they do for the first, oh, when the, when the adults first come out, 
they congregate or aggregate or whatever, loiter, whatever you want to call it, around the edge of the field in the in the weeds. And they're doing that for mating purposes. They eat just a little bit, not much. Again, uh, the adults don't feed much, just a few bites here or there for nourishment. And then they're going to disperse and they're going to go out and lay eggs. So, you know, one of the questions we always get while they're aggregating around the side of the field, can I spray the, the side of the field and will that help control them? Well, you can kill them. We've, we've done trials uh, where you can control decti stem borers, but the problem is they're so mobile. And they're out ovipositing or laying eggs from now or mid-July, clear up until mid-September. Or as long as there's any, you know, green on any soybeans anywhere or sunflowers. Because they also will infest sunflowers. Um, so... Yeah, you can spray around the border of a field and save some sprays, but they infest from other areas also. Like I said, they're highly mobile. Um, crop rotation doesn't work. I mean, we've tried just about everything. We have had a graduate student looking at resistance, so maybe if we can get some resistance and get it uh, into some commercial varieties, that might help, but it's going to be a, that's a long ways down the road before that happens. There is some resistance. Uh, but like I said, it's going to take a while, but it's, it's going to be several years. So right now, our recommendation on if you do have Dectes and you're out looking in oh mid to late September prior to harvest, and you have fields that are more infested with Dectes than others, try and harvest those first. Uh, because what happens, those larvae, they go down to the base of the plant, the main stem, and they'll girdle around and doesn't fall over unless you get a wind usually so as long as you can get it out of the field um, you're going to save that that yield the strange thing about it that tunneling within that plant has not affected yield i mean dr bushman at garden city he did oh four or five years worth of extensive studies to try and see how that tunnel that tunneling from the petioles all down the plant uh, would reduce yield without lodging and it doesn't uh, not appreciably in the way. So it's just the lodging when it falls over on the ground, you can't pick it up. That's that's the main problem with deck these stem borer. But they're out and about. Like I said, our, our recommendation is now if you have a field that's heavily infested, try and get that out before, as soon as it's it's harvestable, you know, before hopefully it lodges or before we have a wind event. So then soybeans, we're also, we just started seeing a few spider mites. Again, spider mites, um, I don't like spider mites. They can be in any crop. If you do decide you want to treat spider mites, uh, make sure you use a lot of carrier, a lot of water, because these are contact insecticides. So you want to make dang sure the contact is made between the insecticide and the mite, right? And remember, most of them are on the underside of a leaf, and there's some webbing there. So you got to pierce, penetrate, whatever you want to call it, through that webbing, and, and get to the mites. Um, just keep that in mind. There, it, it's, it's a tough pest to try and um, control. Uh, one of the other defoliators we have in the, what, in the last three or four years, not quite as bad last year, are thistle caterpillars. Um, thistle caterpillars turn into painted lady butterflies. They don't overwinter in Kansas. They fly in, they come in, they immigrate in. Um, they have at least every year uh, actually about this time about the time the now they'll get in soybeans or sunflowers but about the time that the uh you know probably another week or two it's it's mostly time to uh, the calendar as far as i can tell with these things um they'll lay the painted ladies you see them flying out there uh a lot of the a lot of folks be careful what i say here a lot of folks think they're really neat as pollinators because they're flying around and they're butterflies and yeah I guess they pollinate but they also are depositing eggs and those eggs turn into thistle caterpillars those caterpillars can feed on sunflowers or soybeans okay the problem is they get on the usually they get on the underside of the leaf and they web it up or even if they're in the top side of the leaf they web it up right so if you're going to treat them you got to use a lot of carrier, a lot of pressure to break through that webbing and make sure you kill them. Uh, 
last year we didn't have as many as we had the two previous years at least i didn't see but man three or four years ago up in this area probably about down to hutchison you go out in the morning and the roads would be covered with painted lady uh butterflies i, I mean i never saw anything like it and there'd just be clouds of them uh, and they were heading south for so you know there's a lot of leaf feeding going on in some sunflowers and uh, soybeans but they contribute to the defoliation i don't think unto themselves they're going to be that big a problem but we don't know yet i haven't seen any. anybody seen any no nobody's seen any thistle caterpillars yet but i'm guessing they're coming because they have been the last few years um like i said soybeans right now are one of the crops we're we're concerned about i talked you know what we're mainly concerned you can get a lot of defoliation um you have a lot of different defoliators each species by itself may not cause enough defoliation to worry about but if you have a bunch of them feeding added up uh, what we normally consider as a treatment threshold for soybeans during the vegetative stages 50 to 60 percent defoliation 50 to 60 percent defoliation through the whole field through the whole plant not one leaf here one leaf there 50 percent defoliation um, keep that in mind um, the KSU agronomy has some good diagrams out of how much 50 percent is and it's to me if you look at the leaf I would have considered it 90 percent uh, but so you know it's easy to overestimate but 50 to 60 percent defoliation during the vegetative stages 20 to 30 percent during the reproductive stages may justify uh, an insecticide application for defoliation now one of the defoliators that we're going to start seeing here are green clover worms uh, two weeks ago I found uh, mature green clover worms for the most part last week I think they're probably pupating uh, again they're going to pupate for I don't know three or four days right and then they're going to come out as a little moth and the moth is just kind of a brown nondescript aerodynamic uh, a lot of people call them grass moths you know as you walk around they'll flap out of the grass they'll flap out of the soybeans or alfalfa um, that can be the adult green clover worms and they go around and lay eggs deposit eggs in soybean fields alfalfa fields but soybeans are the ones we generally are concerned with because they can skeletonize leaves quite quickly uh, they're the little green lime green worm with a white stripe on each side and as it moves it kind of has a hunchback or inchworm um, appearance or movement again by the time we notice it you know the small ones are out there and they can do a lot of feeding but you don't notice it until they get half grown once they get about half grown uh, you can start noticing the skeletonization of the of the leaves. The thing about green clover worms, oftentimes they're a host of a fungus also. The fungus is called Bavaria uh, bassiana, but the genuses or genera is Bavaria. It can be different species, but it turns them white. But it takes a while. So after you after, after you've had uh, green clover worm infestation. Maybe you haven't noticed it, but you go out and you start seeing the skeletonization. Start looking in the field. If you see white, little white worms on the leaves or laying on the ground, they're fungal infected. They have the fungus. And that fungus generally does a really good job of helping to control um, green clover worms and some of the other pests. But green clover worm populations are usually the ones that build up enough densities that we notice. It can help with... Um, chinch bugs and I guess that's kind of a segue into my next crop we'll talk a little bit about sorghum um, we talked about soybeans the ones remember the ones that concern me on soybeans are the pod feeders bean leaf beetle feeding on the pod and the corn earworm or soybean podworm feeding on the seed within the pod uh, and then we move to sorghum because those insects will um, especially the corn earworm or sorghum headworm or soybean podworm uh, it's the same species, um, but also we have chinch bugs. Chinch bugs will affect any grass, and they're pretty much, uh, if they haven't gotten your attention coming out of wheat, you're probably good to go for a while. But remember, chinch bugs, after, they, after they've moved out of the wheat in that, migra in that walking migration, they feed behind the leaf sheaths, and they'll feed on any grass. They'll feed on fescue, sorghum, so um, 
wheat, uh, corn, any grass. So where we usually come into conflict with chinch bugs is when we plant adjacent to wheat. So they've been feeding in the wheat all winter, all spring. Uh, the adults lay eggs, those eggs hatched. Those little nymphs walk out because they can't fly. They don't have legs. So if you plant it adjacent, you can have problems with chinch bugs. You can vary the planting date. That's my recommendation. Um, these chinch bugs can only go a week without feeding. If you don't have any sorghum planted there, if there's no germinating sorghum for a week, they'll die. There's nothing for them to feed on, or corn or whatever, any grass, right? Uh, they'll die. So varying your planting date is generally my uh, the best recommendation. If you can't, you can't. The next question I always get are seed treatments. Do seed treatments work on chinch bugs? They do. They work really well, okay? But remember, seed treatments last 21 to 28 days period from the time it's planted until the toxin has dissipated it's not going to be active anymore so 21 to 28 days so if you get out there and you plant your corn early you know plant it in early april some guys are anxious to go and plant and you know and it gets cold and the seed lays in the ground doesn't germinate till may mid-may it's not going to protect that corn seed or plant against anything in the corn either. It's the same way with sorghum. Uh, now, we don't usually plant in cold soils with sorghum, but it's still, if for whatever reason, if it doesn't germinate or if it doesn't have a pest for 21 to 28 days, that insecticide's not doing any good. Okay? Uh, you can't buy corn without insecticide seed treatment. You can still buy sorghum without it or soybeans. Um, at least they were trying to get all the sorghum treated, but the last I heard, you could still get some. But corn, it's pretty much all treated. Remember, insecticide seed treatments. I'm not talking about fungicide. Rodrigo will talk about that in a little while. Um, but sorghum, chinch bugs, if you've bypassed the chinch bugs, no problem. Got sorghum up and growing. Uh, the next problem you're going to have probably are cattail caterpillars or ragworms. Ragworms will start feeding about the time the sorghum comes into the world stage, which is just coming to around here. Because all the the corn earworms that were in the corn, they're coming out and the corn, once the silks turn brown on the corn, it's not attractive for the corn earworm to lay eggs. So they'll fly to soybeans or sorghum or whatever other crop there is. And they have a wide host range also. Okay. So once they start uh, emerging from cornfields, going to soybean fields, um, lots of times after that they go to sorghum fields and they'll feed inside the whirl for two weeks and generally they're feeding inside that whirl. They're in there where those leaves are all rolled up and they'll take a little bite here or there out of that leaf as it comes out of that whirl and unrolls and you see that big ragged hole in it. That's when we start getting excited, excited because, oh, my God, you know, ragworms are out there. Well, don't spray. It's too late. They've done most of the damage the previous week or two. By the time it grows out, the worm's pretty much done feeding. They're going to crawl down into the soil and pupate, all right? Even if you do decide to treat, we've, we, and we've tested it many times, you can't get the insecticide down into the, into the bottom of the whirl to kill the insect. So... You know, there's two strikes against us. Number three, we've done lots of different studies to try and show any yield reductions due to world stage feeding. We can't show any. So we just don't recommend. Yeah, I know it looks bad, um, but it's not going to impact later on. It's not going to impact the plant, okay? Um, now, that's the same insect. Remember, they're crawled out of the whirl. They're down in the soil. They're pupating another week or two. Uh, they come up as an adult, they mate, they lay eggs, then they fly around and they lay more eggs. About that time, the sorghum's heading. That's when you need to worry about it because then they become headworms. So the entomologists are pretty innovative at naming stuff. If it's in the whirl, it's a whirl. A ragworm, if it's in the head, it's a headworm. Um, they feed on the head from flowering to soft dough. There's only about two weeks there. When those kernels or those berries or whatever you want to call them are susceptible to corn earworm, soybean podworm, sorghum, whatever you want to call it, feeding, okay? 
flowering to soft dough. Uh, and then they crawl down the plant and they go someplace else after they emerge as adults later on, okay? But 5% loss per worm per head. That's kind of the easy calculation for losses due to headworms. They're feeding right on the marketable product. 5% loss per worm per head. So you go out and you got, you know, 50% of your heads um, infested with one worm. You can figure out you're going to lose 2.5% overall, right, of your of your yield. And if you got two, three, whatever it is, um, hopefully it's pretty easily calculated. But it's just for two weeks. So, and once you go out and your head's all blasted looking, you got all this cracked seed, cracked you know, kernels and stuff, or, I mean, uh, berries down around the, the bottom of it, don't spray. It's too late. The damage is done. Again, like I said, two weeks. or what? I mean, that's a generalization. It might be 15 days. I don't know. Each variety is a little different. Weather impacts it. But the point is, from flowering to soft dough, once the sorghum gets to soft dough stage, it's past the point where the, the little worms can actually... Uh, utilize it or ingest it or feed on it or whatever you want to call it, okay? So that's pretty much uh, what we need to worry about as far as um, sorghum, I think. I'm trying to think if there's anything uh, later on. Uh, so soybeans, sorghum. Um, oh, I know. The one, one of the questions we've had since, uh, oh, probably 2016, 2017, sugarcane aphids, right? We got sugarcane aphids coming in every year since uh, 2014. First year we found them. Um, so you got sorghum headworms. You know you're losing 5% of your marketable product per worm per head. And let's see, last few years I've had some sugarcane aphids. So if I spray for my headworms, that's going to kill all the beneficials that's helped control the aphids in years past, right? So what am I going to do? That's one of the problems we've had. Um, remember, if you use a conventional insecticide, it's going to kill the headworms, and it's going to kill all the beneficials, and it's going to kill the sorghum, the aphids. There's four different species of aphids. Green, I mean, you know, sugarcane aphids gotten a lot of attention lately, but we've always had three other species uh, in Kansas. You know, 20, 30 years ago is green bugs. We still have green bugs. Um, anyway, if you spray for headworms and using conventional insecticide, you're going to kill the beneficials. And the beneficials have really helped control aphids in years past. Um, but you're going to kill the aphids. The insecticides kill the aphids. The problem is you've killed all the beneficials. A lot of times the aphids are on the underside of the leaf. So the insecticide didn't get down to them. Remember, remember, these are contact insecticides, okay? So that insecticide didn't get down to them, or even if it did, they're still migrating in. Uh, they're going to migrate in until October, at least they have in years past. So they're still migrating in. As soon as that insecticide dissipates, those colonies start up, and all the beneficials are going to lag way behind because they're dead, and they don't, they don't replenish themselves, or they don't build back up as fast as the aphids. So then you can have some aphids, okay? Now there's some products that are uh, that are really relatively specific for aphids, work really well. Uh, if if you you know are worried about that, if you don't have uh, headworms, or um, there's some two new products that I haven't. They're viruses, viral products, uh, Helogen and Fologen. I I didn't hear anything from them last year. Or this year, but the year before, um, they were pr promoting these products. They're pretty much worm-specific. Um, Helogen, pretty much for the Heliothus or the corn earworm. Fologen, pretty much for the fall armyworm. Those are the kind of the two big. Um, yeah, let me. They, uh, they're probably the majority of our head feeding sorghum head feeding worms are either a fall armyworm or corn earworm. There can be armyworms and others, but uh, those two products are. So supposedly specific for those two. They're a virus that cause the insects to get sick and eventually die. But because of that, it's just like you. If you get a virus, um, you know, today it may be three or four days before you start feeling 
the effects of the virus because it takes a while for it to build up in your body, right? Same thing with insects. So there's a lag time. Uh, and so those worms are going to continue to feeding. Um, so what, we've not tested it. We were going to try and test it a couple years ago, and then last year they kind of shut down everything. But anyway, those products are supposed to be pretty specific for the, the larvae if, you, if you're interested in those. And I don't know the availability of them this year. I'm just saying um, from two years ago, from what I saw, they looked like that might be an alternative to a conventional insecticide if you're worried about sugarcane aphids. And one of the other questions I've gotten this year, you know, last winter we had cold weather go clear down into southern Texas, northern Mexico, and a lot of the folks are wondering how that's going to affect sugarcane aphids. <sighs> they survived. Um, I think it might have reduced populations, but they're aphids. They come back and they're, they're migrating north or blowing north, uh, whatever you want to call it at this time. They're not here in Kansas yet, uh, but we'll probably still have one now. Fortunately, the last two years we haven't had as much of a problem with them as we have uh, prior to that. And I don't know if that's going to continue. I would suspect it would because now we've learned uh, beneficials really help. Um, so don't just spray a conventional insecticide at the drop of a hat unless you need to. Um, but anyway, we, we, it remains to be seen what the sugarcane aphid population is going to be like. But the the earworm, fall army worm, headworm, we call them, uh, you're going to be able to go out and determine that right away once those heads start getting into the flowering stage. Okay, anything else? Um, anybody have any questions? You guys have any answers? You just come here for the donuts? I don't blame you. That's a good idea, you know. What the heck? Okay, now I will be followed by the ace of the uh, plant pathology extension department, Rodrigo. He's been around uh, about a year now. Been around about a year now, um, getting a lot of good experience and education. I think doing a really good job. Plus, he's still smiling a lot. So, Rodrigo, good luck. All right. Well, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, everybody, who came today here at the River Valley District. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Rebecca and um, Scott. I really appreciate it. So, uh, plant pathology and tomolish, a lot of things in common, right? Right ID, right identification, timing is always crucial for fungicide application, and some of those insecticides as well. I'm going to start with an overview um, of the state how the crop is looking like, corn, soybeans, and then we're going to cover some of the most important disease and things that we're going to be worried and should we spray or not. And we're going to end this with an overview of the current trials that we have, not just here in Bellevue, also in Scandia and Brazil and Manhattan as well. So this season has been a pretty rough start. Um, corn was planted and some of the soybeans as well. We had a tremendous amount of rain in that early um, stage. We did see some seedling blights, not just in corn, but also soybeans. We received a good amount of samples in the diagnostic lab um, right there in that beginning. Most of it that we saw was um, Phytophthora damage, which is um, makes sense with that cold weather um, and wet conditions that we saw in the beginning. So. Um, as season has been progressing, we have been seeing some of the wet conditions and dry conditions in Kansas, now wet again. Um, and that has been probably around most parts of the state. Southeast Kansas has been quite wet overall, um, with up to 11 inches of rain over a weekend. Northeast Kansas, here in the central, we got a good amount of rain as well, so it's in the northwest. On our monitoring plots, we have seen uh, quite a little bit of disease more in the southeast um, part of the state. And we saw some of the common rust, which is um, early on in the season, which is a disease that likes mild temperatures. And usually it's not a problem for us here in Kansas because that mild temperature, 60s and 70s, it stays right there in that early season. And then as we get warm, it just um, it's not, becomes not a problem for us. So um, back to the, our crop here. 
I'm going to start with solder rust. Um, this disease was just reported in Kansas. Um, Ju July 2nd was just reported. Yesterday was reported in Missouri. Solder rust is one of the disease of concerns for us. Um, Doug Jardine the, um, was our extension specialist here and who was here for over 30 years. Um, used to say that solder rust it was more a late season problem here in Kansas, arriving around August 1st, and usually not a big problem for us. However, this has changed. Um, in the past five years, we've seen solder rust arriving mid-July, early in the first 10 days. Um, and that might be a concern for, especially for the parts where we have late planted corn. Solder rust, if you're not familiar, um, it's that disease that it's a very rusty, um, as the name is described, um, and when you touch, you can also feel that rusty spores on your hand. It looks uh, very small, postures, orange, kind of like a bright orange color, um, and it can be very co easily confused with common rust. Common rust, uh, the lesions are more elongated, and you're going to see that rusty spores typically on both sides of the leaves. Southern rust. On the other hand, we're going to see more on the top surface of the leaf. And they're very rounded as well and numerous, small. So those are some of the characteristics um, that can help us to right identificate this disease in the field. I have not seen yet here on Bellevue and Scania area, central Kansas, as I mentioned, has been reported in the southeast. Um, but I know it's, I always get that question, right? If I see the disease in the field, what should I do? And what are the fungicides um, recommendations that we have right now? So Crop Protection Network um, has put together, well, the Corn Working Group has published a uh, fungicide recommendations for efficacy for controlling for solder rust. So if you have, if you're looking for a fungicide, and are interested in different active ingredients and check uh, more inf for more information on the efficacy of those products, uh, Crop Protection Network has this great table that the Corning Working Group put it together. So on the recommendations, right? Um, right now, most of the corn are either tasseling or getting there. On this area here where we are, Bellevue, Scandia, we're getting to tassel right now. Um, some corns, I was just checking our plots here, still a little bit behind. Um, so the recommendations for, for fungicide, the potential benefit for a fungicide application for solder rust control is from that tasseling to R3. And I always get that question of um, if I do an early application, right, do I need a second application for rust? And the answer, yes, you may need an early application. Uh, a second application if you're going for that tasseling. Usually that tasseling application, it's it, we're trying to hit two disease um, and the second one is gray leaf spot. So if I'm worried about gray leaf spot, you might consider and choose a product that has excellent or very good efficacy for controlling of gray leaf spot but also solder rust. But then you might have to put a second application around R2, um, R3. However, after that, if you're doing only one application, there is a very unlikely uh, potential benefit from that application. In R4 and R5 and R6, there's um, no potential benefit for, for that application. So again, uh, Crop Protection Network has this efficacy table. If you're interested in looking at different products, active ingredients, I, I highly recommend in, in looking at that website. And for solder rust, we recommend choosing an excellent uh, uh, a product with excellent efficacy. So it's a very uh, it's a very aggressive disease when the conditions are right. Um, and talking about the weather conditions, solder rust likes pretty hot weather above 80s and wet conditions. It doesn't need to be rainy. Um, just that high relative humidity, it's already enough to increase that disease and um, favorable that development. So if you're considering a fungicide application, make sure to follow that disease triangle, right? 
you need to find the pathogen present in your field, the conditions need to be favorable, and the host susceptibility. Unfortunately, most of our hybrids are susceptible to solder rust. There are a few of them that are moderate susceptible to solder rust, so I recommend you to check on your seed bag or also with your dealer um, to make sure that you're aware of the susceptibility of that hybrid. And as I mentioned, gray leaf spot, it's another disease um, of a great concern for us here in Kansas, especially on the northeast, southeast, and central parts of the state. Gray leaf spot, um, it's a disease that it comes from the bottom up um, because it survives on that crop residue. Um, the lesions of a gray leaf spot, um, they're that lesion that's narrow and tan in color um, can be confused with bacterial leaf streak. However, if you put a corn leaf against the sunlight or a light, you're going to see that when you have bacterial leaf streak, that that light will pass through it, that lesion. And different from gray leaf spot, that you're not going to see that light coming through it. You're going to see more a dark um, and tan lesion. So... Gray leaf spot, if you had problems last season and you're doing corn on corn again or you have corn on corn for many years, it's a disease that you need to start scouting early on in the season and especially from the bottom up because from that crop residue and in the lower canopy, it's where we're going to have high relative humidity and with these weather conditions now, which is pretty rainy these past few days, um, we want to make sure that we are detecting that disease pretty early on so we can um, have a good management um, ready to go. And on the, on the management part, if you are considering a fungicide application, the current recommendation is that if you have a susceptible hybrid and you find disease on that ear leaf minus three, so there's the ear, the ear leaf, and then if you count one, two, three, and if you find disease on that leaf, on 50% of your scouting, that is a go for a fungicide application. That means that you might consider applying that fungicide and you might have a great potential benefit for, from that application. So um, if you have a resistant hybrid, um, there is very unlikely benefit of spraying um, that fungicide. And the lesions might look a little bit different from a susceptible hybrid where we're going to see those very elongated um, narrow lesions than a resistant hybrid. In a resistant hybrid the lesions might be a little bit smaller and can be confused with um, several other small lesions that we see in corn. One thing that uh, I need to step back it's important for southern rust to keep monitoring not just in your field but also in the neighboring fields and in the southern part of the United States. So southern rust is a disease that we see starting in Texas or in Louisiana and it gets very active there around early June and we see and we can follow actually the reports on the corn IPM pipe website and that disease becomes very active as the crop is progressing down there and we're gonna see those spores, the rust spores that I mentioned they're going to be blown from the south and will make its way here in the Midwest. So whenever we start seeing the reports in Texas and Louisiana and Arkansas, it might be a time to start scouting our fields here in Kansas. And as soon as we see and having those considerations for fungicide application. So those are two important diseases that we, we always are, are concerned here in Kansas southern rust and gray leaf spot. So scouting, it's, it's very important to have a, a very active um, scouting program. And if you're considering going out for scouting, right, what are a couple of things that you have to have in mind? Um, number one, field history. What was there last season? Um, did we have corn on corn or beans and corn? What was the crop rotation? That will help you to narrow down a couple of the problems that you might be having there or a couple of the disease that you might be seeing there. So field history, also plant susceptibility. Uh, symptoms can look different from 
hybrid to hybrid. So make sure that you're aware of that hybrid susceptibility to gray leaf spot, southern rust, and a few other ones too as well. Um, the weather conditions, what, has, what was the weather in the past 10 to 15 days or in the early seasons, right, that we saw that wet conditions. Make sure that you are keeping a track on that too. And um, together with that, if you do not have information from Kansas or you're looking for more to know in a broad range across the state, we every year we put together the management uh, publication for corn, soybean, and sorghum. It, and it's a very good place to check for information regarding disease pressure, um, you know, those crops, to see how was the years before, and to see perhaps what to expect for the next year. So, on the northwest part of the state, we already start seeing some bacterial leaf streak, which, I, as I mentioned, can be confused with gray leaf spot. Um, and we found there a couple weeks ago under the irrigation. One of the differences between gray leaf spot and bacterial leaf streak is that gray leaf, gray leaf spot starts from the bottom up, and the bacterial leaf streak can be found anywhere in the plant. From the upper canopy to the lower canopy and if it rains you're gonna see that bacteria will spread quickly after that and the leaves are to gray leaf spot so knowing where you are and what are the common diseases might help you to properly identify um, what you have in your field and if you still have questions and if you still are in doubt about it what you're finding there make sure to contact your local K state agent, um, and they will help you to send us a sample to the diagnostic lab and help you to properly identify those diseases. You can always contact me, myself, here at K state as well, but they will always work with you. And when shipping that sample to K state, the diagnostic lab, there are a few things that we need to consider as well. Make sure to ship it early in the week so we get that sample before the weekend and it doesn't sit there outside, especially now in the summer. In terms of preserving that sample, it's good to put in a Ziploc bag so you preserve that humidity and that leaf will arrive there in a good shape. If you're sending soil and plant material, you can always put that soil in a separate bag so we don't get that mushy bag. Early on in the season, we received several soybean seedlings with soil together, so that wasn't great. It's kind of hard to even understand what was going on there. So shipping um, the soil separate from the plant is always recommended. Make sure to fill out the um, form that we have in the website, the fact sheet, and add all the information necessary for that. And um, now switching gears for the soybean, as we have here in the back, um, soybeans is, is looking overall really good in the state. I would like to mention two diseases um, that are kind of increasing the uh, importance here in Kansas. One is soybean cyst nematode. Uh, we have right now a free sampling test offered to our growers to this nematode. And what we have seen is that um, this nematode started more in the east part of the state and it's slowly making its way to the west as crop is increasing um, acreage towards that way. So soybean cyst nematode as um, the name, the cyst, right, which is the female that will carry the eggs, um, can survive in the soil for many years. And what we see is that if you plant beans on beans, that cyst will hatch. Um, the, the eggs that are inside that cyst will hatch and colonize the plants and you can go from a 200 eggs to a thousand eggs even within one season. The best way to manage this disease, this nematode, it's starting to know your numbers. So testing is very important. Right now it's free at K-State at our diagnostic lab. So make sure to take advantage of this, um, this, this testing program. Sym symptoms in the field of the soybean cyst nematode, we're gonna see some yellowish stunting plants. Um, and in Kansas, because of our numbers, it's still relatively low. This yield rubber, we're not gonna see much symptoms. Um, however, whenever you're harvesting and you're starting to see some of that 
two or three bushels lower than what you were expecting, I highly recommend you to check for that soybean cyst nematode because even though that you're not seeing the symptoms, they might be the cause of that lower expected yield. Another disease that we have um, and it's increasing our concern is the sudden death syndrome. Uh, we call it SDS. You might have seen the symptoms um, of that disease as well. And it's called by a fungi, this one is soybeans. And the pathogen is actually stays on the root, on the tap root. And what we see on the leaf is just that toxin that's produced by the, the, the pathogen. And that toxin will cause some yellow necrosis necrotic tissue and will cause defoliation and that defoliation it's your main yield problem and depending when it happens the symptoms it can severely decrease your yield like in about 30 bushels um, depending where you are um, SDS really likes cool and wet conditions early on in the season so it's kind of uh, where we started this season was wet and we had even like snow in some parts of the state. Um, so it was favorable for colonization and root infection. And now as crop will develop um, between R1, uh, it's kind of in R3, R4, it's when we start seeing those symptoms. And if we have rain during those uh, vegetative states or reproductive um, Reproductive states, it's when we start seeing uh, the, the symptoms. And if the symptoms are early on, on R1, R1 and R2, it's kind of when we're going to have the highest yield impact. Management for SDS, we start with choosing a variety that is resistant. Um, there are some trials done by Eric A. Dean Rosview, where he shows that just by choosing the right variety for your field, you might... Um, help protecting the yield in about 30 bushels per acre. So it is important to, to choose the right variety when dealing with SDS. However, as a soil borne disease, it takes more than one thing. It takes uh, uh, integrated management, right? So you might consider if you have poor permeability in the soil or compaction to do perhaps a tillage, crop rotation, corn on corn does not help um, I know it's hard sometimes to switch crops because all the equipment, but this disease, SDS, can survive in crop, uh, in corn residue. So it is important to confirm if you have the, the right identification, but also if you're thinking about crop rotation, right, to go with wheat or sorghum for that disease will be the best options. Um, there are two products that are recommended right now, which is um, Saltro and Ilevo. Ilevo can cause a Kotlin burn, so if you're um, a bit afraid of that damage, you can always choose to go for Saltro, which we do not see. Uh, apparently, there's not much yield reduction for that Kotlin burn in the beginning of the season, but Saltro is always a good option. And regarding our corn trials, we can move a little bit towards that direction here. Um, on this part here of the field, we have uh, just a, a demonstration of our FMC trials with Zyway. Um, Zyway is a product by FMC with the active ingredient, which is Flutriafol, which is a pretty old product that's been used for foliar application for a while now. Um, this product, Zyway, it's applied in furrow or in the 2 by 2 and here in Bellevue, we have um, treatments with Zyway by itself and also with nitrogen applied in furrow or in the tube by tube. So what we have seen, what I have heard is that um, Zyway in a couple other states this season, um, there was a few reports of causing uh, lower uh, plant height or delaying that emergence in the early season, especially when it was wet and cold. However, here in Kansas, we have not visually um, seen any damage or any plant um, delay emergence so far. So we're testing Zyway in furrow, apply with nitrogen alone or Zyway alone or with nitrogen. 
Um, so we have quite a few treatments here in Bellevue and also in Scandia under irrigation. And in, in Manhattan and Rossville, we also are testing a few foliar fungicides for corn uh, where we are applying two times, one um, at V10 and one at Tesla now that I just applied yesterday. So soon we're going to have some, some very interesting data from those trials. So is there any other uh, question or... I now we're going to switch gears for uh, NAR, which is a PhD student at our K-State Plant Pathology Department. Uh, NAR did his master degree in Montana in wheat streak mosaic virus, and now he's doing his PhD here with Jessica Rupp, um, working with wheat streak mosaic virus. And he's going to be giving us an overview of wheat streak and the wheat crop uh, during this 2021 season. So thank you very much again for the opportunity, and I hope you enjoy it. All right, now. Thank you, uh, Rodrigo, for the introduction. And good morning, everyone. Uh, as Rodrigo says, I'm a doctoral student uh, at k State, working in Applied Wheat Pathology Lab with Dr. Jessica Rob. Today I'm going to talk about the management of wheatistic mosaic virus. So talking about wheatistic mosaic virus at this time, yes, it is still important. After harvesting also, monitoring our field, the presence of volunteer wheat and other grassy weeds is very important. So wheatistic mosaic is a important wheat viral disease caused by three different viruses, the wheatistic mosaic, Triticum mosaic and high plane wheat mosaic virus. So, wheat stick mosaic causes yellow discoloration or yellow streak on wheat leaves and stunted growth. I have been working in the area of management of wheat stick mosaic virus since my master's degree at Montana State University. One of my projects at Montana State. I studied how daily temperature and presence of volunteer wheat and other grassy weeds impact upon the mite and virus infection. So this virus is transmitted by a tiny microscopic mite. So this mite transmit this virus from one plant to another plant and from one field to the another field. So, on that project, we found that presence of alternative host like volunteer wheat and other grassy wheat and daily temperature, warm daily temperature influence the risk of mite infestation and virus infection. So, presence of volunteer wheat and grassy wheat, especially the downy broom at Montana, increase the, the mite infestation and virus infection by 88% compared to the beer ground without volunteer wheat and grassy wheat at the temperature more than 15 degrees Celsius. So these projects still emphasize the controlling of volunteer wheat and grassy wheat for the management of Wheatistic mosaic virus. So, as we know, viral diseases are preventive, not treatable. Therefore, controlling volunteer wheat and grassy weeds is the one of the most important preventive measure for the management of wheatistic mosaic. Therefore, uh, it is recommended that control the volunteer wheat and grassy weed at least two weeks before planting the new crop plant in the field is reduces the infection of wheatistic mosaic virus to the new crop. The another way of uh, managing the wheatistic mosaic is early planting. That means early planting avoid the, the time where there is a high mite population in the surrounding. 
I am talking about early planting means planting in the later side of the recombinant planting date. When you plant your winter wheat in the later side of the recombinant planting date, you escape the high flow of mite population in the surrounding and that reduces the chances of virus infection in the new wheat crop. So the third and also the important management tactics for the wheat stick mosaic virus management is selection, variety selection. There are couple of commercial varieties, they have resistance genes against wheat stick mosaic. These varieties are Joe, Claracial, KS Dallas, they have WSM2 gene which give resistance to the virus. There are other type of resistance like resistance to the wheat call mite. These varieties reduces the development of mite population in the field. Some of these varieties as TAM112 and Avery. Some varieties has both of these resistance like virus resistant as well as mite resistance. For example, for example, the Guardian. So when you select this resistance variety, then the chances of yield reduction in the uh, wheat production is low. However, there is a, a little bit problem in the in these available varieties because these resistance varieties are temperature sensitive that means these resistance are not as effective as in low temperature in high temperature so resistance is is breakdown in the temperature above 75 fahrenheit so therefore combination of all these tactics controlling volunteer wheat um, early plant avoiding early planting and use of these resistance variety is recommended for the overall management of wheat stick mosaic so i will now talk about one of my project here in um, kansas state so one of my project is surveying the kansas wheat field from this covid pandemic we know that presence of new variant of the virus is very common so that's why the wheat stick mosaic uh, these viruses call, uh, also RNA viruses so that's why the presence of new variant in the field is very common that's why I am surveying the cancer wheat field to find out if there is any new variant of wheat stick mosaic viruses and other uh, wheat viruses in the field. So in the year of 2019, 2020 and 2021 I visited more than 65 counties of the Kansas and collected more than 200 uh, virus infected samples. So during these two years, three years of survey I found two of the fields were totally destroyed by wheat stick mosaic. Do you know the reason? The reason is the, the field has volunteer wheat next to it. That's why the field is totally destroyed and 100% yield loss. Therefore, controlling volunteer wheat is very important. Please scout your field after harvesting to the next planting season and control it. So these collected samples then I bring to the lab and tested the virus positive. So in 2019, I found more than 75% of my samples were positive to wheat stick mosaic. In 2020, it was more than 90% of the sample were positive to wheat stick mosaic. So now, after that, to know the presence of new isolates a new variant of the wheat stick mosaic, I use modern uh, sequencing technology called nanopore sequencing technology in the lab. So this technology 
help us to know the small change in the in the genome of this virus and presence of other viruses in the uh, uh, cancer's wheat field. So, the I mentioned wheat stick mosaic is the complex disease caused by co-infection of different viruses, and we also don't know how many other viruses infected in the single plant. So that's why this modern sequencing technology help us to know if there is any new co-infection, new combination of virus is present in the field. As, uh, up to now, we know three viruses have caused the wheat stick mosaic. So we are hoping uh, my preliminary result also shows there might be possible of infection of other viruses in a single plant. So result will be published soon. Um, then we know the overall vir virus disease is present in the cancer field. So this information, presence of new variant, presence of new combination of co-infection of the virus is very important for the breeding program. It is because if there is a new isolates, a new variant of the virus is present in the field, we should know whether our available commercial varieties are resistant to new isolate or not. If not, we should stop planting these and save the millions of dollars in the field. So then we need to find the new variety or the other variety who is who can resistance to this new isolate. Therefore, this information of presence of new isolate and combination of other co-infection of the viruses in a single plant is very important in the breeding program and this information help us to manage the wheat stick mosaic virus through genetic resistance. So with that, um, the management of wheat stick mosaic virus has three steps. The first and foremost important is controlling the volunteer wheat and other grassy weeds at least before two weeks uh, planting the new crop and early planting in the later site of the recommended planting date and use the resistance varieties of wheat. With that, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to talk about the wheatistic mosaic virus management. All right, I'm Jay Wisby. I'm a crop production agent in uh, Selene in Ottawa County and I just like to, um, if you're watching me, I thought I'd uh, tell you about a few of the resources we have available. If you're seeing this, that you should be getting our agronomy e-updates. Our agronomy e-updates are um, an emailed uh, to a list that you would give to your local extension agent. Just contact your local extension agent. We'll put you on the list. Um, we have great resources here in the uh, in agronomy. So as you can see from our specialists, we've got many more as well. So catching up with the agronomy e-updates, they come out about, about every Thursday, and it keeps you up to date and weekly of all the happenings and going on around Kansas. Also, I'd like you, if you got things happening in your field, let us know as extension agents. It's great to hear, honestly, just to get a feel for what's happening. I mean, we get out, but we don't see everything that you all see. So um, keeping everybody up to up to date and making sure we know what's happening in the field makes it really important. The specialists want to know too and they've, they're they scattered out across the entire state. So um, with that also I'd like to mention that Scott Dooley and his crew here at the North Central Kansas Research Farm is just, he's got it looking terrific people. It's it's doing great. I'm guessing that last inch of rain probably helped out a bit but you know um, it's it's doing well and I'm hoping if you're hearing this that uh, you realize the kind of resource you have right here in your backyard. Feel free to reach out to Scott, um, Rebecca, Sandra Wick. Uh, we're all kind of here for here to help, and um, it's really nice to see. And, and I hope you understand the resource you have. And I guess I'd also like to mention Tuesday, August 17th, 6 p.m. at Scandia headquarters. I know Rebecca mentioned this, but i got to repeat it because I want you all there. Um, we have three more specialists, and we'll go over plots and, 
and some really cool things that they have going on. So thank you all for tuning in, and yeah, that's that's all I have.